We have two speakers today. First, let me introduce Tim Northrup. Tim is our Chief Insurance Operations Officer. Welcome back, Tim. Thank you. Also joining us is Karina Franca, our Marketing Analyst. Welcome back, Karina. Thanks, Dave. Let me turn the program over to you. I'm very excited, Tim, to participate on this because I have some questions on, on property insurance. So what is what is a cover, what does not cover? So what is really property insurance? I think it's best to start with defining what property insurance covers from a perspective of real property, which are things like buildings right, and things that are permanently attached to the buildings. And there are, the other category is personal property, or often we call that contents. In the church setting, that might be hymnals, um, podiums, audiovisual equipment, and things like that. So things that aren't permanently attached to the building. Um, during this presentation, we're going to give some examples of limits and coverages. And I thought it was important to state up front that the examples I'm giving are the base coverages on the, on the ARM policy. Your conference may have chosen to purchase other coverages in addition to meet your needs, but we're going to talk about the basic coverages and limits. Great. We want to talk about some of the things that a policy covers. We often hear fire. We know that's covered. Smoke. Explosion. Um, I got a story of a claim that happened on explosion with a Seventh-day Adventist uh, location. And we might think, well, what's, what could a Seventh-day Adventist church or school be involved in that would cause an explosion? Well, there was a, a, a dwelling where the hot water heater actually exploded from the basement and blew straight up through the first floor and out through the roof. Wow. That's an example of an explosion and a claim that might have come through that. Uh, obviously, we know a lot of the others can happen. Uh, one of the claims lost leaders in our book of business right now is theft and burglary. So wanted to point out those are covered. Um, to kind of hit a risk management thing here, we will talk about some resources available to prevent those. So on water, you have water damage. Uh, so let's say I left the water hose open and forgot about it, went back home after all day work, and my basement is floated. Mm -hmm. Is that covered? That's a great question. We often hear, and you'll see on the top of this list, that flood is an exclusion on most of our policies. If you were to leave a hose running beside your house with a sprinkler and water were to show up in the basement, that would not be flood. That would be water seeping through the ground and into the basement from a, a man-made object. Uh, it's important to point out that we use the word flood often in casual conversation and that it ha along with that comes certain connotations within the insurance industry. So my advice is if you have water damage in your building, no matter what it is or where it is or how it showed up, that when you file the claim with Adventist Risk Management that you avoid using the word flood. Just use I have water damage. So it's very important to make sure we use the right words when filing a claim. So in case of water damage, we don't call it flood because it can get excluded. It could be. It's, it leads our claims examiners down a path. Allow us to investigate the claim and determine what it is. Okay. Um, I also want to talk on a few other exclusions. Uh, a big push we have is wear or maintenance. Wear and tear is excluded. So it's important that you maintain your buildings. Renovation damage, government action, nuclear hazards, war and terrorism. Pollution is another one. If you're at an academy or a school and you have a shop and there are oils and gasolines in cans, it's important that you prevent those from seeping into, into the ground. And we have several resources on the website about schedule of maintenance and how to keep safe all your stuff so you don't have any problems That's a great of the point. sort. property not covered. We talked about exclusions under the policy, and now we'll talk about specific real property that's excluded on this policy. Okay, oh. before you get there, what is the difference uh, between exclusions and not covered? It's a great question. The, the exclusions are causes of loss or things like that that are excluded from the policy. These are real pieces of property or things that we can identify that are not normally covered on a property policy. The first one in the list is automobiles. It goes without saying there's an auto policy your conference should have purchased that would cover damage to automobiles. Underground pipes, flues, or drains are often excluded on property policies. Animals are excluded. So how, 
animals. So what if I have horses in my property, let's say a summer camp, and then a torna tornado comes through? Aren't they covered by the policy? Under the normal policy, they are excluded. If you have a camp that has horses, my recommendation is you contact your account exec and get those animals endorsed or scheduled onto the policy, and then they would be covered under the property oh, okay. policy. So it's important that you make that phone call or that email to make sure those horses are covered under the property policy. Um, we talked about pilings, piers, or docks. I often get the question, I just bought a parcel of land. Do I need to buy property insurance? No, there's no physical building there. There's nothing to insure. It's just a parcel of land. The statement of values, it's important to note that the property policy is what we call a scheduled policy. What that means is if the piece of property is not scheduled and shown on the policy, it is not covered. So each one of you should be familiar with the statement of values, and we've given an example of one here, just the top portion of it, which has some very important information I want to review. You'll notice there's a place called the name of the church. That's where the name of the church would obviously show up. And then we have the building conditions. This example, the coverage is replacement cost. In a few slides, we'll give a better definition of that. It's important, though, that you make sure the building value is correctly stated here. If you know you've done renovations or you know that the cost of building in your area has gone up, it's important that you update these values. Uh, the contents on this, this location on replacement as well, and you'll notice the contents value is $753,000. So notice to, to update the square footage of the building. Like I said, if you added a location or added some uh, an addition to it, you need to update that. And when is the right time to, to, to add that to the statement of value? When you start an addition to a building, and we'll get into a little more detail, but if it's a small addition, building a new Sabbath school room or you know, putting up a new wall, as soon as you start that construction, it's, you need to report it to the insurance company and let us know. Um, I point out on this, it's a very basic arithmetic here, but if you take the building value and divide that by the square footage, that will give you a cost per square foot. So for this location, we would take the $3.2 million in building value and divide that by the $23,000, and that comes up to about $134 per square foot. This is a good way to check and see if would it cost more than $134 a square foot to build a commercial building in your area. And my guess is in most parts of the country, that's probably a little bit low. So that's a quick math check you can do. I always recommend contact a contractor in your conversation. Contact a, a contractor in your location and ask him or her what's the average cost to build a commercial building in your area? There are four different types of coverages you can have on the property or on the property pulse for a building. The first one we'll discuss is the actual cash value. And the example I give is you take a, a roof that has a 20-year life on it. If that roof were to get blown off at year 10, the actual cash value of that roof would be 50% of its original value. So mm -hmm. the same application would apply to a building. Um, agreed max is an important one. It's where you, as the insured, have said, I realize I have a $200,000 building, but for certain circumstances, I only want to insure it for $100,000. I'm making a conscious decision to underinsure that building. We'll work with you and do that. I always caution in this area, though, that someone made the decision at one point because you know, maybe the church was struggling in membership or money, and they, they chose to put it on the green max. Ten years later, the church has grown. It's, it's, it's really doing well, and no one's taken it off a of green max. The church is still underinsured, and if a loss occurs, a lot of people will be surprised. Replacement cost, I refer to it as the best or the Cadillac of the coverages. This is the one we all strive to get our buildings on. Um, but this is where we need a partnership with you. If you know you have a building that's in poor conditions or needs maintenance, we would ask that you put it on actual cash value. But if you have a building that's in great condition, it's valued correctly, we want to partner with you and put it on the replacement cost coverage. Um, there are benefits that come with replacement costs, and we'll discuss some of those in a few slides. Um, there's a little bit of a misnomer here. You hear the term replacement, and everybody thinks the building burned to the ground, it would be replaced. 
the reality is it's still within the parameters of the building value that's shown on the schedule of insurance. The builder's risk is another important one. If you're starting to build a large building or build a new building or something like that, you need to contest, contact us immediately and say, I'm getting ready to build a building, here's what's going to cost in the end, and we'll put it on builder's risk. Builder's risk has some very unique coverages for while a building is in construction. It's going to cover the, the building materials on the ground, tools that might be in your care, custody, and control. But the key is on builder's risk is once the building is completed that you come back and report to us that you want it on replacement cost, actual cash value, or agreed max. Um, I think I have a good uh, example for builder's risk, I think. So let's picture a situation. Let's say I'm remodeling my sanctuary and the fellowship hall. And the project, it's divided into phases, right? The phase one, it's completed, it's done. That is my sanctuary. And what should I do while they are still working on phase two, remodeling my fellowship hall? That's a great question. If phase one is truly complete and you've received an occupancy permit, you can take that part of the building and put it on replacement cost and start using it as a sanctuary or whatever needs you might have it. And while the other phase two is being completed, that can stay on builder's risk. It's important though, when you do get that occupancy permit for part of it, mm -hmm. to move it off builder's risk because you'll get coverages like contents and other things that aren't included on the builder's risk coverage. Oh, okay. We talked about contents a little bit. It's very important that you have your contents listed correctly to the correct value. Um, churches are constantly buying new audiovisual equipment. We're in the age of technology where we have big screens up front, and these add value to the contents, and if they're not reported correctly, they may not be covered completely in the type of loss. It's important to do an inventory list. Do, do I need to have a list from the name and serial number of the carpets to the toys used at the cradle roll, like everything? How, how detailed need to be my list? <laughs> this is one of these questions where I think more is better and more can make it easier, but I understand the real life scenario. I think if I was doing an inventory list, I would identify high value items in my church. It might be the screens, mm -hmm. it might be the audiovisual equipment, if you have a really nice refrigerator in the kitchen. And yes, uh -huh. take the model number, take those types of things and have those, those documented. Another real easy way to handle this is to take a video and videotape all the rooms in your church or school. You don't have to be really detailed, but just walk around the room and show the things that are there. Um, understand, at the time of loss, we're here to partner with you. If you tell me you had a 50-inch TV, we're going to take you at your word. But if you have an inventory list or a video of it, it makes the transaction a lot easier, easier. and we'll replace you to whole quicker. Sure. We want to get into a few of the, the coverages on the policy that I think are important. Um, the first one is business income and extra expense. Recently, and you'll start seeing this represented on your policies, we made a change to the policy. Um, it is now, it's, it's, the limits are now stated as 10% of the building and contents limits up to 750000 So for example, if you have a $100,000 building scheduled on the policy, 10% of that, or $10,000, would be available for business income and extra expense. So I see the loss of income. Uh, in which cases are you referring to it? It's tides, tuition? Tuition is a great example. If you have a school and your school gets damaged by fire and you're unable to use the school, you can probably show that you lost students, so there's a loss of tuition, and this could come in and help make up for those loss of tuition. Tithe, on the other hand, as a church, we expect the members to pay tithe, whether or not the physical church is there. We're going to assume they go to another church, they pay it online. Yeah, they, online today is a very common way. Exactly. Yeah. Extra expense is a great coverage if, you're, if your church gets damaged and you're unable to use it, and you're able to go down the street and rent a gym or whatever, we will cover extra expense associated with renting that gym. The key is, though, is if, you're, if your electric bill had been $1,000 a month at your regular church and it was only $900 at the new gymnasium, that wouldn't be an extra expense. It would still be within the expense you had had at your, your previous location. Another cover, 
Another coverage we want to discuss is ordinance or law, and this is a very important coverage in today's world. Ordinance or law are things that you will become responsible for if the building burns to the ground or gets damaged that an ordinance or a law requires you to have better than what your building may have had. So for example, if you have a really old building and it didn't have handicap accessibility or an elevator or didn't have sprinklers, there are up to the limit shown there available to help make that building up to code as it were. Oh. It's important to note that this coverage is only available for buildings that are on the replacement cost. So I go back to the previous slide where I say we want to partner with you, we want to get you on replacement costs, but we look for a partnership and make sure we're putting quality buildings under that coverage. Personal effects of others is another important one. Obviously we, we have pastors and teachers who don't necessarily have an office. They come to church, they do demonstrations, they bring things into the classroom to, to help the kids understand the real world better. When they're bringing their personal things into the work environment and they are for business use, if they were to get damaged or destroyed while there, this is the coverage that would respond. Would that be an iPad or a laptop? It definitely could apply in that area. If you've brought an iPad or a laptop to do your presentation as a pastor and you're using it for work and it gets damaged, it could be covered under this policy. It's important to note there are, you know, there are deductibles that would apply and most of our property policies have a $1,500 deductible, but there are some very expensive computers. Uh, it's important to note that this policy or this coverage does only has $25,000 worth the, the limits there. So, if you're a pastor or you're an office person, you know you're bringing in some very high value you know, audio visual equipment to do a seminar or whatever, contact the conference, contact us, and we can obviously in increase those limits for a specific need. Tim, we've talked about different things uh, under the proper insurance, but I've heard before about gap, gaps in insurance. Is that something that we should worry about? Is that additional coverages for those gaps? Definitely there are. We, we've talked about some of the coverages that are available and we'll talk on the next screen here about a few of the additional coverages that I hope will, will shore up some of those gaps. Um, if you as a conference go and buy a new piece of property, we, we refer to that as to newly acquired or constructed property if you were to build it. And it's important to know that if you didn't get that reported to us the day you bought it, there would still be some coverage available for it. Uh, there are co there's coverage without you reporting it to us for up to 180 days after the purchase or the finish of the construction. It is limited to $2.5 million. Mm -hmm. But that's where you're at the office, you're busy, and you forget to report something. There is some sleeper insurance that will hopefully help make whole there. Great. Preservation of property is a great one, too, that I think is a partnership between us and you. If a loss occurs and part of the building is damaged and you can take other property that's in the building and move it away from it to prevent it from getting further damage, we will cover the transportation of those that property um, to and from where it needs to go for up to 30 days. So it's important, this is once again a partnership, if you can prevent losses from happening further, we hope the policy will respond there. Yeah. Um, monies and securities is the one I'll touch on here. Obviously we have churches who treasures, we're collecting offerings, there's, per, there's money and securities on site, and then we have people who take those to the bank. If something happens in that transaction, this policy can respond for that as well. Um, I would say if you run into a scenario where you believe there's a gap in coverage or you have a unique thing that's going on, contact us. We'll do our best to put a policy in place or coverage in place to cover that. I would be re remiss if I didn't talk about loss control a little bit here. I know this was uh, property insurance, but loss control and insurance go hand in hand. Um, we are have a campaign. We were looking for you to partner with us and have preventative maintenance going on. Plan ahead. Have a budget ready for maintenance. Good safety practice. We're asking that you have risk managers and safety office at your locations. Staff training. Um, this is one of those areas where we're doing staff training by a webinar. We also have the local safety officer webinar series that's going on as well. Log in, get your people to log in and listen to those. We'll hope you find they're useful. Karina, obviously in marketing communications, you guys are putting together information all the time. Would you mind sharing a few of those things? Yes, one of the great things we have is the info sheets on crime, fire, water. Those were the top, in, top three losses in property that we've seen. 
and we have solutions that uh, it's our weekly newsletter great articles and quick tips solutions for for you guys to for our clients to be able to find great resources we have YouTube videos as well and the webinars videos for a safety officer that you just talked about I think maintenance loss control is a great way to keep everything as they should be so then we won't have any losses yeah all of these things are available on our website and I heard you mention solutions that's a that's one dear near and dear to my heart log on to our website put in your email address it's free you'll just receive it every week and it's a great resource we cover a lot of different topics and solutions the worst happens a loss occurs what do we need to do obviously there is a deductible that will probably apply and the deductible is the amount of the loss that you the insured will be responsible before the insurance pays. Um, I, would, I would ask you to look at your insurance policy, and I know that's a boring read, but I will, I will ask you to look at the one endorsement that's called <laughs> the deductible limitation endorsement. And this is an important endorsement because it's going to show the deductibles that are in place. Um, we call our all other endorsement or all other deductible, and it usually is about $1,500, and some of you may have ch chosen to purchase higher deductibles. There's also maybe a wind and hail deductible depending on what part of the country you're in. There's a name storm deductible depending on what country, part of the country you're in. There could be a flood or an earthquake deductible. Get familiar with that deductible limitation endorsement. It's an important one. It's your responsibility on the policy from a monetary standpoint. So the higher deductible, the lower your premium, is that right? The two definitely go hand in hand. Um, if you ask at the time of quote for some deductible options, our account execs can work with our underwriters, and yes, if you increase your participation in the losses, it often results in a lower premium. Okay. It's important that we, I've mentioned the word partnership quite a few times during this presentation. When a loss occurs, we ask and the policy asks that you do all you can do to protect the property from further damage. That may be if part of the shingles get blown off that you can get somebody or a contractor to come in and put some tarp over the roof and protect it from getting further wa water damage. If there's a water pipe that breaks and the basement has six inches of water, you don't need, you shouldn't wait for us to give you permission to take care of that. My appeal to you is even if it wasn't a cover loss, you as a good steward and owner of your building would want to get that water out of the basement any. Anyway, so call a mitigation company, have them pump the water out. Don't don't wait for us to approve the bill to approve the claim. Take pictures, document, but do what you need to do to protect it from further damage. How do we file a claim? We want to make this process as easy as we can, and so we have four different ways that you can do that. In my opinion, the email at claims at adventistrisk.org is probably the easiest one. You can go to our website download a claims form and email it right to our claims email box. They will respond to you within 24 hours and acknowledge your claim and give you instructions on how to proceed. Do I need to have pictures or any documentation before I do that? You don't. We want to know about the claim as soon as we can. We will walk you through the process. We will help you understand what you need to document. We'll send a claims adjuster out there to help you. Don't you worry about lining up all the information. Allow our experts to do that for you. So it's very simple. It is very simple. Um, obviously, we have a phone number, a fax number, or if you really like snail mail still, you can mail it to us. Great. Very easy. And we also have on our website an uh, info sheet called How to File a Claim. It gives you a glossary with all the terminology that you might not be familiar with so you can understand really well and file your claim. Just to wrap up, this is an important policy. It protects the churches and the schools we own. It's important that you recognize it as a scheduled policy and that you need to contact us and let us know what buildings you own and audit and make sure those are correctly um, shown. With that, we'll turn it over if there are any questions.